But <laughs> for now, they're going to focus on the Age of Empires 4. Looking to get at least that second place spot. Here in the upper bracket finals, we have got Vortex versus BCQT. Let's get underway. And we see BCQT in the blue playing French. And now let's take a look at the town center placement here for Vortex playing Mongols. Next to gold, Barry's close by, not really what we want to go for. Ovu, nice and defensively, has some extra sheep as well. Vortex has to be happy with this map. Yeah, I mean, right now, like, looking at the generation overall, he has most of what he needs. The Uvu is tight near the tree line, so it's somewhat naturally defendable. And that's very important up against the French, because if BCQT does play the tempo controller, as French players used to do, he's looking for this open ground to exploit. And everything in Vortex's base is fairly condensed, so that might be difficult for him to achieve. Three on wood still. So the big question is, if we get to 150 wood, are we adding a pressure? Add, are we adding the barracks? I think against French, I don't mind the barracks opening. I don't mind the spearmen villagers mm. now running over there. Let's follow them. Other direction. Other direction. No, no, wait, no look. There. We're watching sheep okay. survive a wolf. They're outrunning Pester. a wolf. That's not realistic. I'm calling BS on that right now. We need to give wolves a speed buff. Anything less than two, and I'm disappointed. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> pass your opening. Should be into two passes quickly. Vortex just trying to unlock his win condition. The interesting part, actually, is that uh, the French in this matchup, if you look at the stats side of thing, the Mongols have a 63.7% win rate against the French for good reason. Ooh. Do you want to know what that reason is? It's, uh, it's been increasing the last week or two in terms of like win percentage. And it's because of the it's return of the Magadai. Nice. Yeah. Tell me more about the Mango Die. They sound like a fun, enjoyable unit. Yes, definitely not an oppressive unit. It's a very fun unit. Uh, they are the true pew pew ponies, the drive by ponies, if you will, as they are able to fire on the go. And they are easily always able to get away due to that Pessy Khan, which is surprisingly effective against the French, because the French like to build this thing called Royal Knights. And because it's royal, it must mm -hmm. be good, right? But it only moves at the same speed as the Mango Die. And the Mago Die never have to move, or stop moving, rather, to fire, which means that you can very easily cheese the mid game against French if they go for the standard opening of Knights. Okay, that sounds pretty imba. What can the French player do against this? What can they do against Mongols? What can they do against such reckless hate? You can write a very aggressively written letter to Relic being Ooh. disgusted at the state of the game and asking that Magadai get nerfed further even though they haven't been used competitively for over three months. <clears throat> Vortex, is that early? No, that can't be early wheelbarrow. This is such a weird girl time. You don't it's want to get very wheelbarrow. Early. You don't have enough on wood. You don't want to invest all that gold. I guess it like keeps the wood line efficient without moving the gold. And it will eventually be useful anyway as you move out. But yeah, to, to like give a serious answer to your question about what the French can do against the Mongols. I think it once again comes back to that castle age timing. Some ways you can combat it instead is one of the older builds for the French, where you go very hard into the archers, and then you try to, like, ram rush your opponent. But it's not often you see French players engage with rams anymore. That being said, one thing that BC does like to do that makes him very unique, not many other French players do this, and it has proven to be interesting, at least, against the Mongols, is outpost rushing. In a sense of irony, we might see that out of BC, because he did do it against Marine Lord when he's playing the Abbasids, and I believe... Just last weekend, we also saw, or actually I cast a series where in a French versus Mongol matchup, the French player tried to outpost rush the Mongols base. Yeah, that was last weekend, right? And there was a highlight video, like highlight mm. plays of the Golden League. And that was actually the first scene of that video. Like you going bananas <laughs> over <laughs> a tower. But yeah, hey, it makes sense it's... because the matchup is so different. Hey, one tower can change everything. That was more or less what set up the entire story for a trilogy of Lord of the Rings movies. So, you know, just saying. Ooh. Yeah, otherwise it would have been way more peaceful. True. Yeah, nothing peaceful here, Thank though. you, tower. As, Thank you, tower. As the Vortex Khan is in being annoying because BCQT's gold line is a little bit too far away to be protected. So over time, that's going to add up and be annoying. You know what the frustrating thing is about the Khan, actually? There's no counter to kill it early on unless the player micros really badly yeah yeah i i think especially in the future we will see even fewer can losses and people will like babysit it so much more than they're already doing and i know that some top players would like to see the range damage removed 
simply because it's so strong as a resting unit and can kill sheep, which shouldn't be intended, mm. that some people feel, okay, it should only do melee damage and duckage. Yeah, may maybe because so, like, it, has to, it pulls out a giant crook out of nowhere to attack sheep, right? <laughs> I don't know where it's storing that, but we don't know where the village is stored there. So maybe that like balance that element, because that is quite strong. I don't think the damage is too much. I would actually be a fan of having more activable abilities. I'd love it if there was general type units that every Civ could unlock later in the game. Just because like, I think it's it creates a lot of interesting depth on a micro level. And I think that's actually why a lot of these players who came across from like games that were micro-intensive instantly gravitated towards the Mongols. Yes, they were broken, but they also offered up a lot more micro-intensive gameplay early on. I think they mainly did it because they were broken. <laughs> that too. But... <laughs> 5% of it was the micro was fun. Only okay. 5. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I, I like I like the Civ design of Mongols. Maybe not everything is balanced, but they have such uniqueness to themselves, so much identity. Absolutely love it. What I also love is that B Security is going for professional scouts here and will get quite some reasonable food income for himself. Obviously, Vortex still heavily on gold. This is a Castle Age approach by him. Yeah, it's, it, it makes sense, right? Like we, we talked about, you need to kind of boom up for the castle. Like both of these civs, the win condition lies in castle. And it's a weird one because the way that you achieve that win condition as the French here is different to what they usually do. Usually they pressure their opponent, they raid them in, they chip away at their economy. They're like, ah, I've got like five villages over you now and I'm also generating them quicker. I'm just now going to naturally scale in to castle. But in this situation, like Vortex has potential options available to him. We talked about the Magadai, but interesting instead, with the Spearman now pushing out, I feel like he's trying to choke point with some outposts. And there is some exploitability because if he gets on the eastern side of BC's base, he can deny both the gold and the wood away from the French player. Could someone do the math on that Gur town center thingy? This, I, I, like, really this looks on so the efficient. The, the this interesting so part efficient. is that you trust Twitch chat to give us accurate maths and not bait us at all. Hmm. And just to prove yeah, my point, in a moment, you're going to read there. that the maths says the answer is 69. And then, like, that's it. Oh, but, no. Oh, no. All right. <laughs> it's where we're going. <laughs> I've tried this before. This this is why i done my own maths for today. Actually, I didn't. I stole it from someone on Reddit. Really big shout out to them for doing the work for me. But no, in, in this situation, like, it, it seems like it's worthwhile uh, just to min-max the, the wood drop-off, and you will eventually use it for wheelbarrow anyway, right? So, like, realistically, you need a Gur anyway. And he has no other dire use for a Gur, other than plopping it right here. Like, he doesn't need it for the gold. He's not going to go on berries. So you might as well just plop it here because he wants wheelbarrow. This is basically Castle Age versus Castle Age without a single unit lost. Yes. Both went wheelbarrow, <laughs> some professional scouts... Spearman now protecting. We're going for step rid out, replace there. This is pretty uneventful. And now we go for an archer range plus guild hall. Guild hall, no surprise. Archer range? Maybe some archers to deal with those spearmen? Well, we'll or are we just... waiting for Abilit here? No, he's just going to wait it out. I think they both know what this is going to turn into. Now, the question is what happens next? Because Vortex, if he plays into Lancers like I think he's going to do, he really heavily relies on his Yap. And he hasn't set up a forward network yet. This is an important detail, because if you take direct clashes with French Knights, you will not trade favorably. They are a better unit than your Lancers, because if they're both Castle Age, the French get the bonus damage after a charge. The Lancers do not. Well, you need to get all those upgrades first, though, right? Your Lancers are Castle Age Lancers. Their Knights are Feudal Age Knights. Yeah, but the timing, and... right? They're both going to be Castle before the fight occurs. Yeah, but the opponent needs to invest into some upgrades first. Chivalry, you also produce some more Lancers. Like, in the long run, I 100% agree with you. If we yeah. had 20 minutes and both go Knights, Lancers, it's so much better for French. But at the 9 minute 30 mark, I think Mongols might have a short timing here. Yeah, I think it's deceptive, right? Because you have to argue the fact that Vortex is going to have to run across the field. And also, if BC just drops a second stable next to his School of Cavalry, he almost gap closes the efficiency of the Uvu play. So like then it becomes a quality over quantity because you should have similar numbers. And also you mentioned the arbitrators already. Like if both sides start producing that unit, 
like their crossbow comparative. Once again, the French ones fare a little bit better. I think what dictates these fights in favor of Vortex is the Yam, and he needs to get those outposts down soon or move the Deerstone to the front to allow for this. That would be interesting. I would tear Mong Castle Age Knight upgrade against Lancer Mong. So Relic Contest will be interesting. Relics all scattered throughout the map. Slightly better for Vortex. Oh. Now the first Lancer is coming in. We should find some scout goods. Yeah, th this is actually really well played by Vortex. He's trying to force a fight before the upgrade comes through, but there it is. The veterans he achieved, so he will be buffered away. And although you had to leave behind the carcasses, he can just renew and pick them up because the issue you have is like you don't have Yam still. But I understand why Vortex is doing this. Like, you can't allow Beastie to get this free economy. It's exactly what has justified him going for Castle Age, and he needs to get at least two deer stacks to make it worthwhile. Khan now helping out, tries to focus down the archers, knows that knights might potentially heal at some point with the chivalry. Abiliteers are coming in as well. Finally, oh, did he? Why did he move <laughs> all the villagers in the gold there? Felt a bit weird. Huh. He's going for a second TC, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> there you go. There's your explanation on everything that's happening right now. Vortex, he sees the opportunity. This is smartly played as well. Right now, Beastie's playing blind. He's making the kind of mistake that we usually see from the pro scouts meta. When you play towards these deer, you're not using the scouts for the name, right? You're not checking on what your opponent is doing because you're trying to be efficient about gathering meat. And it means that Vortex is going to sneak this play due to his midfield control. And Beastie QT is probably not going to identify it for the next two minutes. Let's take a look. That's not a lot of archers. Six around there. Some are really tears. Lancers are coming in. This would be a good fight for Vortex. Oh, he's got the numbers right now. And this is because BCQT didn't go for the second stable. So he's not juicing up his production right now. He's on the defensive. And Village is going to be exposed. Needs to be careful because right now Vortex could turn around and club him down. There it is. Lancers strike straight away. Several villages going to flop to the ground. And the army is folding quick. BCQT. He miscalculated here. All because he decided to play into the monastery instead of the second stable. So he didn't have a big enough defense force here. What a nice move here by Vortex. Found quite some kills against the archers. That makes the spearmen more efficient as well. Now goes for professional siege engineering. Ooh, Vortex could have quite a possibility to find some damage. Meanwhile, obviously, scouts still doing their duty. I mean, mm. the, the, the oh, different oh, oh. duty to what they need tower. to be doing. Oh, he can't get it up. The reactive tower is going to be too slow. Lance going to chase it again. More villagers going to fall. And it feels like right now, BCQT, he's going to have to hemorrhage three, maybe four villages before he has the correct amount of forces to repel his opponent away. He is at least starting to get the Arbor Trees, and that is the answer to this aggression. Feels like two versus two relics kind of guaranteed here. Although, if I look at it, it's three in the center. Mm. Still up for grabs. Way more map control as well. Maybe the one at the right-hand side. Feels like the weird one, but I think, oh, prediction. Uh oh, the monk will actually is, give is its it? position away that he's going for the relic at the right hand side. Or well, more important than that, what's happening right now as he shifts to check out what's happening near the relic, he's going to spot out all the scouts and they will die quick to the lances. They're going to have to bail on the corpses that they want to get away. And instead, they're just going to flop down. One or more, he ditched the carcass. Second one will join in, but that's a heavy hit. BCQT needs the surplus resources. I think his deer count is actually starting to dry up underneath his TC. Maybe we can get an update there. We certainly saw that some farms were wow. being added. And yeah, two carcasses, three, four carcasses, but still none of those will have the full HP or full food. He is on stone with his guild hall. He wants a TC. Interesting. Very, like, he was on the stone hard, right? I think he wants the TC or he wants the defensive keep. The keep makes more sense here because of the pressure is being applied. I wonder if his strategy will change once he spots out the second town center of the Mongols. Because that's when you I understand that you're behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The thing is, like, he could go for some more villagers if he wanted to go for the second town center. But I also think the all-in, ah, I don't think it will work. It's too much army for Vortex. Plus, he goes for the counter army now. This yeah. will be the repeat. This will be how Viper played it as well. Oh. It has to be the aggressive keep. Oh, he just got the stone. Yeah, Look at he this. Did. He will go for double keep aggression. Yeah, onto the central sacred site. He wants a staging point. He can set up a full base here as well. That's going to gap close pretty quickly. And he's baying him away. This is beautifully done by Beastie. He sacrifices a few knights, understanding that even if they die, look how much space it creates. This keep will go up successfully without any harassment. And that is critical because right now, Beastie, he's behind economically. He can't afford to hemorrhage more villagers at this stage in the game. 
crossbow numbers should rise. Oh, oh that's Mongols a obviously can deal with this one reasonably well. Freebie, not really. Knights are getting away as Ooh. well. Villagers all saved themselves. So that one was a nice distraction move, as you said. Where do you place your next keep? So, your next keep, if you want to go for one, it has to be towards that TC now. Like, you can actually get one on the side of the tree line, I think is the next play. But you have to make the same play, and if Vortex now spots out that keep in the center, he won't be peeled back the same way he was, first of all. So, I think that's where, like, Vortex is like, you know, fool me once, shame on me, right? Like, fool me twice, like, it's not gonna happen. <gasps> Do you see that? It's walls. It's wall o'clock, baby. First game of the series. These guys were watching the lower bracket, stroking their chin, and they're going, I feel like the cast is one of the more walls. So allow me to fix that. Now, yeah. this, this game will take some time. Mm, because Vortex is. now needs to go for traps to kill that keep. Then we will see another keep buying time again. Vortex will have the better economy. BCQ has no real incentive in fighting as well. He actually got the three relics. Now the second town center, BCQ, this keep is basically oh, only yeah. to buy himself time. Well, we, he wants the boom now. So the interesting part also about these wallings is it's going to allow room to build farms. Doing this is dangerous against the Mongols due to how easily Maganels can kill the farms, right? It's a 350 health structure. But because he's already preemptively walled up, he's now going to reach a critical mass point after that tree line is drained where he needs to go into farmlands. But because he's layered these walls, he will have that wiggle room and Vortex won't be able to raid him as easily. And that's the other beautiful thing about these keeps. These keeps are actually drawing a lot of attention. So if Vortex has actually quit raiding, he's all in on getting rid of the Sacred Site keep and it means he's no longer seeing what BCQT is doing. Although, see this, another keep going up. If Vortex was watching or was seeing what we are seeing, he just completely attacked through the center and win the game. Military wise, he's 45 to 19. There's such a little army for B security. He's just trying to maneuver himself uh -oh. in, into weird positions. Keep now goes down. And yeah, you see, Vortex realizing he has a timing window. He's attacking. He has to go. The keep on the side is going to draw his attention, though. Like, it's not denying the gold. It wasn't quite close enough due to the sprung upgrades in the outpost. So, BCQT has a staging point again, but no way of actually fully utilizing it. It's a defensive keep. It's not a production keep. So it doesn't have that double-layered effect that you're looking for as the French. And also, he never even captured that sacred site, so it's not like he was getting gold trickle. The only reason he's justified in doing this is because of the guild hall. It's what enables him to be cheeky like this. He's just getting it for free. Guild hall could have generated other resources yes. as well, right? He could have had more abilities. Oh, look at all those villagers. Obviously, oh orientation God. is clockwise oh for God. those villagers, so they will work to walk towards the castle. But he doesn't know it because Vortex is getting pinged about the outpost being attacked. So he's like, eh, shrugs his shoulders and looks away at the fight. And it means he's slowly hemorrhaging villages. And that means the BCQT is slowly closing that gap. Remember, the French, they have a better production speed on their villages. And he is also now on two TCs. So the gap will slowly close in favor of BCQT. Did we miss any raids? How is BCQT 15 villages behind? He got hit he pretty hard early like on. It, it, he got hit hard early on. And also look at his food right now. He's struggling to produce enough because he's in the middle of a farmland oh. transition. That's the issue he has. Yeah. He just drained all the Trebs. deer at the back and everything else. Wait, what? <laughs> Trev's like, hit me, hit me. You've killed all the villages, now kill us as well. And he'll deal with it now, but it, it's, it's just delayed. It's really wacky. Like you said, BC could have invested this elsewhere with the guild hall usage. But it's just buying time. Like, he's trading 800 resources for like two minutes each time in this game. And it's pretty damn effective. Yeah, found the villager kills in addition to it. That that was like how what made it worth it so so much more. Sent the villagers away as well, so one lose those at the front. Mm -hmm. Still, fourteen villagers behind though. So it's also your step readout, Vortex. right? Like, look at his income. Um, You're not you haven't been gathering for ages. It's hurt Vortex's scalability. Like his siege army hasn't got bigger, and his lance account hasn't got bigger. Did Beastie Q and Marine Lord train together? You'd think it, right? Like they, they like to just kind of chip away at their opponent in funny ways. I think they've done a little bit of scrimming. BCQ, see, the main one I remember is he was doing a lot of games with Viper. Uh, when they were scrimming, they were more or less coming out at draws after like 10 plus games. So, kind of shows you how tight these high level players are right now. But Vortex, he's going to breach through the center. I think he's read it. He understands what's happening here. He's being time wasted. And as he's on the clock, he will move in a defensive keep near the base of Beastie Cutie and Beastie. This is where you have to start staging a war force to hold back what's coming. 
And that's why his food is increasing quickly. You can see the income is going up as he generates more farms. He needs to get a front line that can hold this back. How? 23 military against 84. This is an unstoppable force. Well, Traps are coming forward as well. So much siege, so much infantry. Like, Beast Security needs, like, the biggest <laughs> Magnus shots ever against this. Well, he's in again on that gold line. Always being a pain. So right now, the issue with Vortex is he's once again hemorrhage gold. So he can't replace what he loses on the front. So if BC can turn this fight in his own base, Vortex is going to struggle to quickly replace the losses. Meanwhile, Beastie QT is in a state of scaling. As you can see on the eco count, it's evening up. In fact, the butchering that's occurring here is going to give BCQT the economical lead for the first time in a long time here. Wow. How many kills did he find again? Obviously, he's never out. Always a great spot to raid, but how many villagers? Like, he lost like 25 villagers in this game now at this you spot. You'd think the villagers would get a little bit suspicious when they show up to mine here and all the bodies <laughs> on the floor. Like, what happened to this guy? Nothing. Just pick up the pickaxe. Why is it covered in blood? <laughs> just just mine. Okay, it's not blood. It's paint. Why do you need red paint and then it's the like, And then knights are arriving and killing your neighbor. And you're still continuing to mine. And then he's hitting you at your back and you're not telling your picking neighbor as well. <laughs> hey, man. They, they saw what Genghis Khan done to the other chieftains. Poured molten gold down their throats. Like, we don't want to hear that, okay? We fear him more than we fear those poncy French knights. Just keep mining. Okay. Fair enough. Keep going up again. BC, like, this has been efficient, but you need an answer soon. The spiral count is increasing, but he's quickly running out of time. Vortex is knocking at his door. 110 military. Not sure when we saw that last time. Like, and we didn't have a big fight for quite some time. The security is somehow trying to make a hold happen. Four sprinkles are coming in. If they clear up all the traps, no, security is buying himself quite some time. Look at the numbers. <laughs> There's so many, right? Like, how, how do you deal with this? This is the issue. This is the power of the Mongols. This is exactly why building in the field is getting nerfed in the upcoming patch. It's too powerful because of the ability to snowball outside your opponent's base like this. Like, instantly. And as the Mongols, you also get a movement speed, so you can gap close even quicker. And that's what he's doing now. Shots coming in. Springles trading out from each side, trying to distract Vortex. The widespread by Beastie Cutie getting good trades here, as most of the Springles of Vortex are down. The Arbor Trees start to move in. Good fight for BC Cutie. Up to 25% of the opponent's army now with his great maneuvers. No, he just calls it. He doesn't even hang around. He understands when he sees over a hundred military force standing outside his base. The game is over. Game one will go to Vortex to open the best of five. Vortex just felt in full control. The early lancers there and security needed a bit more time i think maybe a tower at the berries could have helped out just <sighs> the, the first attack was so good and then the second town center vortex knew he only needed to defend went for crossbows went for spearmen and be security lacked the time to switch because some good rates some good rates but then so much invested into stone and keeps he built mm -hmm. four keeps just imagine like 3,200 other resources that could have been invested into knights, getting more raids in, into siege, getting some more sprinkles in the center. Yeah. I, I like the first two. Like, the first two were good, and then it's like, your opponent has figured out your strategy. Transition time, ding, ding, and he had time. But I don't think he ever switched off stone. We didn't check it after that point, but look at the numbers. I'm pretty sure it was stuck on stone generation the entire time. I kind of understand the paranoia of needing keeps to protect yourself. But once your opponent has like four trebs, is it not better value to get onto food? Because we saw the numbers, right? He never made the full farmland transition. And that also occurs due to the fact that one, he's up against Mongols that will burn them down and get paid to do so. And two, his secondary wood line is not safe. It's to the front and the side of his base. So he doesn't want to play out front when his eco is still behind.